Hello and welcome to another complete Cambridge IGCS EPE lesson. In this video, we'll break down and simplify 16 recent past exam questions on Chapter 8, Skills and Skill Acquisition. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing to the channel. Give the video a thumbs up and visit my channel page for short summary videos and my resource store by clicking the link in the description for complete revision and teaching materials. Let's begin. Our first question is on topic 8.5, the stages of learning. And as always, you can head down to the description of this video and find links to the relevant short summary videos. So if you struggle to answer a question, go and watch the relevant video, then come back and attempt it. Describe two characteristics of a performer who is in the associative stage of learning. So two characteristics for two marks. There are three stages of learning, of course, the cognitive, associative and autonomous stage. So the associative is the second stage, otherwise known as the practice stage. So associative learners spend lots of time practicing or repeating actions. They learned the skill in the cognitive stage or learned the basics. And now we move into the associative stage and practice and repeat that action um, and become more proficient over time. So they become more consistent. This is my second point. They make fewer mistakes than cognitive learners. I put in brackets there just to clarify the point. So I'm making a bit of a comparison to another stage of learning there as well. Now we won't go through this in too much detail, but I recommend you pause the video here and familiarize yourself with some of these points because these kind of questions on the characteristics of the different stages of learning come up quite often. And as you can see, there's lots of different things that we could have talked about. So take a look at that one. So describe using examples. This is important. We need to include examples here. How visual guidance benefits a performer at the cognitive stage of learning. So visual guidance, of course, is guidance that can be seen. So demonstrations, videos, images, etc. So how is it that visual guidance benefits a beginner or a cognitive learner? Why is it appropriate for a cognitive learner? Well, the question mentions using examples. So I've started off with one. So demonstrations of a skill allow learners to see clearly how it should be performed. So cognitive learners are, are beginners. They don't have a clear picture yet as to how the skill should be performed and demonstrations can help to resolve that. So that's a benefit to the cognitive learner. Then videos of a learner's performance, that's another example, can be used to identify what needs to be improved. So if we're making mistakes, but we're a real beginner, we might not know that we're making them. And watching a video helps us to see all the little mistakes we're making so that we can take steps to resolve them. And finally, videos of elite athletes, that's another example of visual guidance, help the learner to see how a skill is used in a competitive context. For example, a full game. So the cognitive learner may be learning the skill, for example, a serve in tennis um, or shooting in basketball in isolation. Uh, but by watching videos of elite athletes, they can see how those performers use the skill in a game context. So that's another benefit to a cognitive learner. So three marks awarded there. And again, I'll uh, encourage you to pause the video here and take a look at some of the other points we could have included. Question number three, topic 8.6 on feedback this time. So explain the importance of receiving feedback when learning a skill. Another really common question, so important, uh, that we familiarize ourselves with some of these points. It's worth three marks, which means we need to make three distinct points. So why is it important to receive feedback when learning? Well, feedback helps performers to identify their weaknesses and take steps to improve. Okay, so by receiving feedback about our performance, we can see what we didn't do too well, and that will enable us to make changes to improve in the future. It also allows them to measure their progress, which can be motivating. OK, so if we see ourselves improving, that's going to motivate us to continue and try and improve even further. And it helps to prevent the adoption of incorrect techniques. So when we're learning a skill, we could be learning incorrect techniques without even knowing it. And feedback will help us to identify that and resolve that and make changes. OK, so lots of other points we could have made here. In fact, if we just see where these marks came from, it was one for the first point. I would have got another mark just for saying that. Feedback can be motivating. Um, if we look down here, motivates a performer to want to improve was worth a mark as well. So I would have actually got four for that one had four been available. Okay, 8.1 on skill and ability. A really simple question here. Describe one feature of a skill and one feature of ability. So what are the differences between skill and ability? Okay, so skill 
it is developed through learning or practice. Okay, skills are developed through learning or practice. We need to spend a lot of time to become skillful, whereas ability is genetically determined or inherited. It's generally regarded to be passed down from your parents. You're born with it. Um, and there are other things we could have talked about here as well. Skills can be easily adapted through practice or learning, whereas abilities are innate. They're very difficult to change. They're enduring. Okay, so there are the key differences between those. Next question on topic 8.3. This is skill classification now. So state an example of an open skill and a closed skill from one named physical activity. So we need to name a physical activity first. And the command word is state, which is really simple. No description or explanation required. So the physical activity I've gone for is basketball. You need to pick one that um, clearly includes both open and closed skills. And basketball is a really easy one to talk about because an open skill, there are many examples from games, but closed skills are quite difficult to find in games. And a free throw is a really good example when you're standing on that free throw line and just replicating the action again and again. Uh, very few environmental factors affecting the way that skill is performed. So there's the closed skill there. The open skill, which is affected by the environment and constantly changes. An example could be a chess pass during open play or something like dribbling around the court, which I think is actually included in the mark scheme here for open skill, a player dribbling around an opponent. That's going to be done in a different way each time, depending on the position of the opponent and how they're acting, etc. OK, so next one. Justify your answer for the open skill in BI. Well, I've already partially done that. Uh, by talking. So the open skill was the chess pass during open play. Why is that an open skill? I need to justify my answer. So the execution of a pass in basketball is determined by factors such as the position and movements of teammates and opponents, as mentioned, meaning the skill is performed differently each time. And this one was worth two marks, so I needed to make two points, but I actually made three here. If we look down at the mark scheme, I would have got a mark for saying the player's actions will be determined by the actions or position of teammates. So I mentioned teammates there and opponents. That was the second point. And I would have actually got a third mark for saying that the skill is performed differently each time. OK, the diagram shows the stages of a basic information processing model. So topic 8.4, name the stages labeled A and B. So really simple question, A and B, what are those stages? We've got input and feedback and we'll go into a little bit more detail on the stages of the information processing model um, as we continue. In fact, this question is on the information processing model as well. So explain using an example of a skill in a physical activity, the role of decision making and output in the model. So we pick an example of a skill first and I've gone for a penalty kick in football. And we need to talk about the role of those two stages, the decision making and output stage, with reference to the skill that I've chosen. So the decision making stage, the player decides where to place the kick, okay, based on factors such as the position of the goalkeeper. So very simply, this is where the decision is made. So the player is going to look at the goalkeeper. If they're positioned to the left of the goal, for example, they, may, they might decide to shoot to the right. And then output, the decision is acted upon or in brackets, the player takes the penalty. So output's a very simple one to describe. It's simply the decision that was made being executed. OK, so decision making player decides where to place the serve. And this example is serving in tennis. So again, it's just a decision. What will I do? And then the output the player performs the serve. So a really simple question, that one. OK, state three factors that cause variation in skill levels. OK, so this one's on topic 8.1 on skill and ability. There are lots of different factors that affect how skillful performers eventually become, and you need to state three of those. So the first one I've gone for is the amount of time spent practicing. Obviously, if we practice more, we become more experienced. We're likely to become more skillful. Number two, the quality of facilities and coaching. If we have great quality facilities and coaches, we're likely to develop skill um, much better than we would if we didn't have access to those things. And then finally, the level of motivation. Top level performers tend to be very, very motivated because it takes so much time and effort to become a high level or elite performer. So if we're more motivated, we're likely to become more skillful. And we could have included any of these points here 
age, maturity, experience, or the stage of learning. Culture, motivation, anxiety, arousal conditions, facilities, environment. I go into these in quite a lot of detail in the short summary video on topic 8.1. So if you want to go and watch that one, you can find the link in the description as always. Okay, topic 8.2. Describe using examples from a named physical activity, three characteristics of a skilled performance. So 8.2 on skilled performance. The physical activity I've gone for here is badminton, but you could choose almost anything for this. So the first characteristic of a skilled performance I've gone for is consistent. Okay, so consistent, there are six that you need to know. And I need to use an example from badminton to demonstrate my knowledge of that uh, characteristic. So the player is able to execute a drop shot time and time again without hitting the net. So consistency is all about being able to do things over and over again to a high standard. And I think my example accurately explains that. My second one is accurate. The player is able to place the shuttle close to the lines. So during a rally, they're not just hitting the shuttle back into the middle of the court. They're aiming for the lines. They're pushing their opponent into the corners of the court. And that requires a lot of accuracy. And then finally, goal directed. A smash is used to put the opponent under pressure and win the point. So again, that's an example from badminton of where the performer is showing that they're directed towards a goal by using smashes. They're clearly trying to put their opponent under pressure and win the point, which is their goal. They're trying to win every single point in order to win the match. OK, so I'll just pause this as we go down. You can see different examples from different sports. The first one, they're fluent. So a performer is able to perform a skill without hesitation, making quick decisions and moving smoothly. That's what fluency is all about. And you would need to provide an example there. Aesthetically pleasing, which is about how good the movement looks, and that's very important for things like gymnastics and diving, where you're being judged and you receive a score on how, how good, essentially, the performance looks. Because Consistency, accuracy, we talked about, goal-directed also. The final one down there is coordinated, so a performer being able to move different parts of the body efficiently and with control. For example, a basketball player dribbling the ball, they need to use their feet, their eyes, their hands, potentially both hands as well, and that requires coordination. Okay, next one, we're on topic 8.4 again, information processing model. So as you can see, this one's already come up uh, once or twice. So it's quite a common one, and I would recommend you put some time into learning about this topic uh, because it is a really common question. So the diagram shows the stages of a basic information processing model, same diagram as before. Explain using an example of a skill in a physical activity, the role of each stage in the model. So here we need to come up with an example of a skill and then describe each stage of the information processing model in relation to that skill. So I've gone for shooting in netball and the first stage was input. So in fact, if we just go quickly back to that inputs that first stage. This is where we're receiving information from the environment, first of all, before we even make a decision. So the goal shooter or the player sees the position of defenders, teammates and their distance from the goal. So they're taking in lots of different cues from their environment during the input stage. And that is an example there that relates specifically to my uh, skill that I chose. Then the decision making stage, once we've taken in all that information, the player is going to decide based on that information. And uh, my example here is to shoot. They decide to shoot instead of passing. Then the output phase, that's just the execution of that decision. So the player executes the shot. And then finally, the feedback stage. The player sees that they were successful. OK, so they're gaining feedback. They saw the ball go in. That's feedback. They saw that they were successful and will likely make a similar decision in the future. So why did I put this last bit? Well, if we go back to the diagram again, we can see that feedback goes back into the input stage. So this is not a closed system. It goes round and round. So once we perform a skill or make a decision, we get feedback. Was I successful? Did it work out? And then we're going to use that to improve our decision making in the future. OK, so the player sees that they were successful. And as a result, they're more likely to make a similar decision in the future. Whereas if they missed the shot and it didn't work out, maybe next time they would consider passing to a teammate instead. OK, so the mark scheme here, the example given was for a batter in cricket. And you can have a look at these uh, four stages, but the examples are very similar to the ones that I provided here for netball. Uh, but take your time and go through that one. OK, another one on 8.4. Explain the concept of limited channel capacity. So the hypothesis of limited channel capacity 
uh, suggests that a performer is only able to process one piece of information at once. Okay, so generally in sport, we're, we're receiving information from lots of different sources. So auditory information, for example, from our teammates calling out and communicating with us, but also visual information, crowd noise, um, the movement of defenders, teammates, etc. And if there's too much information at once, we cannot process it. So it suggests we're only able to process one piece of information and that too much information may result in overload and poor decision making. So we're all, uh, we're all familiar with this concept when we're trying to concentrate on something and there's lots of noise going on, people are talking to us, there's lots of visual things in the background, it makes it quite difficult to concentrate and that can lead to poor decision making. So a performer can only process a certain amount of information or one piece of information at a time. That was my first statement. Too much information can cause confusion, okay, information overload, or too much information can result in mistakes being made. So very similar to the answer that I provided there. Explain using an example of each the difference between skill and ability. Okay, this one's worth three marks. A skill, for example, a spike in volleyball. So we did need to provide an example of a skill and an example of ability. So my example of a skill is a spike in volleyball is learned and refined through practice. If you remember, we've already attempted a very similar question already. Skills are learned and refined through practice. You're not born with them. An ability, however, for example, speed when running. So the components of fitness uh, are generally linked to ability. So some people are born with, uh, with high levels of speed or power or strength, okay, or endurance even. So an ability, for example, speed when running is largely innate. Okay, so that's the difference there. Um, the skill is learned and refined through practice and the ability is innate. So where are those three marks gonna come from? Well, if we look at the mark scheme, you're gonna get one mark for describing an example of a skill, one for describing an example of ability. So I've got my spike in volleyball, uh, speed when running for my ability, and then one mark for an explanation of a difference between the two. And I've gone for learned and refined through practice for a skill and largely innate, or you're born with it, so you can't really change it for an ability. Okay. Name the second stage of learning and describe a characteristic of a performer at this stage. So back on the stages of learning, topic 8.5, this one's worth two marks. So name the stage, the second stage, this is a really easy mark. It's the associative stage. Of course, we've got cognitive, then associative, then autonomous. And the description of that associative stage for the second mark, during this stage, performers begin to develop intrinsic feedback. So I've gone for a different point this time. Um, intrinsic feedback is feedback come, that comes from within yourself, of course. Okay, so as you become more proficient, as you understand the skill a little bit more, you begin giving yourself your own feedback. Okay, you start to be able to identify whether you did something well or not because you're becoming more experienced um, and therefore you can start identifying your own mistakes. And I put that in brackets because it's not needed for that second mark, uh, but always a good idea to add a bit of additional detail. So the associative stage for one, and then we could have made lots of different points here. So um, characteristic of a performer, well, we're making lots of, we're, we're, sorry, we're practicing, we're repeating the skill over and over again, we're improving. Our techniques getting better we're making fewer mistakes we're becoming more accurate more consistent more able to make judgments in technique okay so loads of different points we could have included there and again it's becoming clear that you really need to know the characteristics of those three stages of learning so put some time into that one back to the information processing model again is this the third or fourth time we've had a question on this but this one's about short-term and long-term memory instead of the stages of the model. So describe the differences between short-term and long-term memory. Long-term and short-term memory have a key role in the information processing model because what we remember will determine how well we make decisions. Okay, and remember that feedback stage, the final stage of the information processing model, we're gaining feedback and we're building up memories that will help us to make better decisions. So the first difference the short-term memory is only able to store a limited amount of information, so we can only process a small or keep a small amount of information in that short-term memory, while the long-term memory has a vast capacity. Um, it's almost limitless, it can hold a huge amount of, inf of information. So there's our first difference. And then our second one, information is only held for a short period of time in the short-term memory, quite obviously self-explanatory, but it's held for long periods of time in the long-term memory. So a simple question, we just need to make two comparisons between those two points. 
What else could we have gone for? Um, information is retained in the long-term memory. We hold on to it, but it's lost from the short-term memory if it's not practiced. Okay. But if we do practice, inf um, if we do practice, then the short information in the short-term memory can then be moved into the long-term memory, and that's how we we gain information in the long-term memory. And it's relevant for your revision process here watching this video. The more times you go over these questions, the more times you attempt them, you are likely to move your information from short-term to long-term, which is where it needs to be for your exam. Okay, 8.6 uh, on feedback. So receiving feedback can reduce the anxiety of a performer. Uh, this one is not about anxiety. It's just a bit of an introductory statement there. Explain three other benefits of feedback. So three benefits of feedback. Second time we've had a question like this, but this one's worth three marks. I think the previous one was worth two. Feedback can be used to identify strengths and weaknesses in a performance. That's the first point. It can be used to make adjustments to a training program. So if we can see our weaknesses, that will help to inform a training program. Um, so I need to resolve my weaknesses. So we're going to then use the training program to do that. And then finally, um, I put here int sorry, extrinsic feedback in uh, brackets, but feedback helps the performer to feel supported. So that's extrinsic feedback, feedback that comes from outside of yourself, for example, from a coach. If you're receiving feedback from a coach or teammates, that helps you to feel supported and not isolated. So these are just three benefits of feedback, but there's lots of other ones we could have gone for. Again, pause the video here and get familiar with these because clearly this is quite a common question and one you need to be familiar with. Okay. In fact, that was the last question on chapter eight for this time around. Um, there were 16 questions there and we only actually looked at three papers, the May, June 2019 series. So we're looking at five or six questions on skills and skill acquisition per paper. So it's quite highly represented in your exam. It's likely that you're going to get a fair few questions on this chapter. So take your time, go back over these questions, have a go at them, get familiar with the mark schemes. And uh, if you struggle with any of the topics, head down to the description and watch my short summary videos. They contain literally everything you need to know on the chapter. Uh, but that's it for this session. So like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment down below if you have any suggestions for how these videos could be improved. As always, I hope you found this lesson useful and I'll see you next time for 12 questions on chapter nine, psychology.